Hi, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Keys History and Discovery Center. I'm Brad Bertelli, the curator for the facility, and uh, we're back to for our Thursday edition, exploring some of the um, exhibits here that we offer at the museum. And again, if you have questions at any time during the, the talk, feel free to type them in and Aaron will let me know and I can answer them live on the air. If not, I'll be sure and um, get back to you during the course of the day so, or, or whenever you decide to type in your question. And um, today we're going to talk about the World War I veterans who came to the Keys. Uh, these were the bonus marchers, um, and it's kind of a long, kind of a long story to get them here. Um, in 1924, Congress passed a adjusted compensation certificate, otherwise known as the Soldier's Bonus, for the World War I veterans who had served, and this bonus would pay the soldiers a dollar for every day they served, plus a dollar twenty-five for every day they served over a year. Now, according to the uh, the bill that was passed, these benefits would be paid in 1945 or at the time of their death, which in which time the money would go to their family. Now, this was during you know. As the Great Depression, you know, builds and people are out of work, and people, you know, are going hungry and they're homeless and they and they need money, there was a Texas representative named Wright Patman who introduced a bill to Congress to for early distribution of these funds, and this is in 1932. Um, and then, and then in order, you know, to show support for this bill a group of several hundred veterans from out in Oregon decided to march across the country and, and you know, to gather in D.C. to show support for the bill. And as they be, be, you know, continued to march across the country, their numbers swelled as more and more people, more and more people joined their group. And by the time they reached Washington, D.C. in June, there were more than 20,000 of these bonus marchers who, who arrived in the streets of D.C. and they were camping, you know, and um, hoping that this bill would pass. Uh, in July, the bill was voted on and it failed, I think, by six, 62 to 18. Um, it failed to pass. And, you know, the... The veterans were unhappy, and Herbert Hoover is in is in in office as president, and he basically unleashes uh, um, Patton, no MacArthur. I'm sorry, MacArthur, um, on the veterans, and there's tear gas, and the tanks are in the streets, and they're kind of chasing the veterans away, and then Hoover subsequently loses the election, and then. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected, elected into office and brings and promises his new deal to bring relief and recovery and reform to the American people and, and get them back to work. Now, one of the programs that, that Roosevelt um, instituted was the Federal uh, Emergency Relief Administration. And this was a way to provide states with monies to get their pe get the people back to work and to you know and and Julius Stone was one of Florida's Farah representatives, and Julius Stone had an affinity for Key West, and um, he uh, creates his office in Key West, and he goes on a uh, a, a campaign. He recognizes the tourist you know the potential tourist. Um, destination that Key West was, and he, you know, got people to refurbish like 200 houses and clean up the streets and plant trees and clean the beaches and make it more presentable for tourism to come down. One of the things that Julia Stone recognized um, was that the overseas highway in its current incarnation was really a hindrance to bringing tourism down to the Florida Keys. At this point, uh, there was the highway, it was, it was possible to drive from Miami to Key West, but that trip in, 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 entailed a four-hour ferry, ferry trip from Lower Matacumbi Key to No Name Key in order to complete, uh, to complete the drive. There was that, that, 40, that 40 miles of missing, 
a, a missing um, a roadway. And so Julia Stone wanted to um, eliminate the ferry system, which was not always reliable, and create a series of bridges that would that would connect, you know, that would that would connect the islands and make it a, a much easier drive from the mainland to Key West to make you know to make the uh, uh, tourists arriving much easier. Um, now, one of one of Stone's ideas was because they, they they needed to get the, the the veterans out of D.C. and, and they needed need to get these people back to work. And a group of them had been um, assigned to go to Fort Jefferson for to um, to work on at Fort Jefferson down the Dry Tortugas. And these this group of men, of veterans, was in either Jacksonville or Saint Augustine. I can't remember off the top of my head. Waiting permission to go down to work in Fort Fort Jefferson. And Stone um, floats the idea of having these veterans having this become a a works project. Um, uh, to build these, to build these, um, uh, uh, this solid bridge system, and it, it's it, it's it's a successful bid, and so these workers who were in uh, in Jacksonville or San Augustine who were waiting to go to Fort Jefferson were redirected to uh, Upper Matica, to to the Matacumbi Keys, to this, this area for bridge purposes, um, to build these bridges and eradicate this need for the ferry system. Um, now. This first wave of this small wave of veterans arrive, and then they build these work camps, these three work camps. There was one on Windley Key, kind of at the foot of the uh, Snake Creek Bridge, and there were two work camps on, on Lower Matacumbi Key, one in the area where Robbie's Marina is, about mile mark of 77.5, and then a, sec a, a second one at the other end of, of Lower Matacumbi Key where the automobile ferry departed. And these, each of these work camps uh, could house as many as 250 people each. And once they were filled, what essentially happens is the population of the Upper Keys essentially doubles in size. Uh, there were about, in, in 1935, there were about 650 residents, people living in the Upper Keys, Key Largo, uh, you know, Plantation Key, Windley Key, Upper Matacumbi, uh, not so much on Lower Matacumbi. Um, but, and these, and these work camps, and we can see a couple pictures behind me, nothing but tents, you know, just uh, tents at, at sea level, basically. And, um, and they are being paid a dollar, a dollar a day, which is interesting because when the railroad workers who built Flatter's Railroad you know, in 19, in, between 1905 and 1916, these men were paid a dollar, a dollar twenty-five a day, and now we're a couple of decades later on, and these workers are are, are paying one dollar a day. Now, one of my very first jobs as a curator at the Keys History and Discovery Center was to go up to Tallahassee and interview uh, uh, who was then the oldest living survivor of the 1935 Labor Day hurricane, Wilbur Jones. And Wilbur was a safety engineer uh, in charge of these work camps. And one of his jobs every Friday was to go to the work camps and to hand out a dollar advance if anybody need, needed an advance on, on their pay. And what's interesting, because the, the, the World War I veterans locally seem to you know, have a pretty bad rap of, you know, of, of, of being you know, drunkards and fighting and kind of causing a bit of chaos here in the Keys. And Wilbur Jones is the only one who ever um, kind of refuted that description of them. And he would talk about them you know, as being out of work doctors and, and lawyers and, and men who were just trying to earn money for their family. And no one ever took that dollar. He said, very rarely did someone ever take that dollar. They wanted to you know, earn that money and send it home to their families so their families could eat and, you know, and, and pay their bills and, and, and survive. But. Um, what happens is on Labor Day, uh, September 2nd, 1935, um, you can see these, these camps, these, uh, these tents behind me. Um, not with, and also you know, kind of some clapboard shacks would not be very you know, uh, durable refuges, refu refuges during a storm. And here comes the 35 hurricane, which to this day remains the most powerful hurricane to ever strike North America, a category five devastating storm with uh, you know, 185 mile an hour winds, 200 mile an hour winds, stronger gusts coming in, 18 feet of tidal surge would come washing over, 
washing over the uh, over the islands. And these veterans, you know, had, had been in the war and faced, you know, had, had faced machine gun fire and really did not understand what a hurricane was. And many of them were, you know, bring on the hurricane. We're not afraid of no storm. We faced worse, you know, overseas in Europe. And um, it really was a devastating uh, effect on the workers who were essentially left left in these tents. Um, th there was a train that was called down to to take them away and, and to safety the, uh, the safety of the mainland. But that train was delayed. Uh, I believe I talked about that on Tuesday. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, there was an idea that they could just call call the you know the train and have it come down in you know a matter an hour or two, and that but that phone call had to go to Jacksonville, <clears throat> and then from Jacksonville to Miami, they had to oh, <coughs> excuse me, they had to get the the train engine burned you know fire burned up and get the the, the locomotive going. Um, once it's and they had to get a crew together. They had and once the once the train starts to come down, um, it come down to, to the keys, uh, you know, first they decide to turn the, tr the locomotive around so it's going to pull the train down and then it, it, it would be faster to push it off the keys once it was, the people were loaded onto it. They encountered a drawbridge that was open that, that, that delayed the train. On Windley Key, um, they encountered a, uh, a cable had fallen across um, from one of the um, cranes that had fall, fallen across the railroad tracks and got entangled in, in, in the wheels. And um, so that, that delayed another, you know, another you know, hour. Yeah, Aaron, you, you have a question. So we don't have a question, but just something to add on this topic. Um, you know, I've chimed in several times with recollections from my family members who were here during this time. And my grandfather was seven years old um, with, when the storm was approaching. But his father, my great-grandfather, uh, was driving the laundry truck, truck for the laundry service that um, took laundry back and forth between Key West and the Upper Keys. And the day the storm was approaching, they drove down to the ferry terminal to see if the laundry was going to be sent up on the ferry for them to pick up. They didn't know if it was going to come or not with the storm approaching. So they went down and they were talking to some of the veterans and my great-grandfather offered to bring as many as he could up the keys to sturdier buildings because as you pointed out, the, the, the camps were in many instances tents or nothing more than shacks and the veterans so firmly believed that the train was coming to rescue them, every single person they offered a ride to wow. declined and said, no, the train is coming to get us and unfortunately, you know, a week or so, you know, or days and up to a week later, my great grandfather was then helping in the effort to recover those bodies and and burn them at funeral pyres. Yeah, at the cremation sites, which there was like 25 of them up in the, in this area. Wow, great great addition to that. Thank you, Aaron. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the train that doesn't arrive until 8:05 at the Alamada Depot, which is kind of where the uh, U.S. Post Office is today, and the. Um, you know the the full fury of the storm at this point is is already already upon us or upon the area. And 20 25 minutes after the train arrives, this 18 foot wall of water comes and washes over the, over the island and knocks knocks the train train over. And so none of these veterans were able to be to be um, whisked away to safety. And there are of, of and no one knows exactly how many veterans were here during the hurricane because. If there's a, a silver lining to, to the story is that the hurricane hit on a holiday weekend. So many people had gone to Key West to party or to celebrate or to the mainland to celebrate. And we don't know how many people were actually still on, in, in, at the campsites. About 250 uh, of the veterans were killed during the hurricane. Um, e an equal number of, of, of local citizens were also killed. A devastating, a devastating account. Um, but that's and that's going to kind of lead us in um, to tomorrow's for field trip Friday when we're going to weather permitting. I know it's there's a tropical storm out there and we're getting some feeder bands. Today is supposed to be the heavy rain day, and tomorrow um, we'll hopefully we'll have some sun or at least a break in the weather so we can go down and look at the work effort that, that the veterans were were doing. They were located on um, you know the 
the main camp at, at Lower Matacumbi where they were building this first series of the bridges that would kind of parallel Flagler's train. And that first bridge would have linked Lower Matacumbi to Jewfish Bush Key at the time. Um, now, it's, today, it's called uh, Fiesta Key, home of the KOA. Uh, there's a KOA camp, campground there. But there are some artifacts out in the water that we will look at tomorrow during Field Trip Fridays. And um, there's also a lot of mythology and some, and some rumor and story about, about those structures who, that are you know, uh, kind of called the coffins by locals today because they do kind of look like coffins out in the water. They're actually bridge piers. And we'll talk about those, those tomorrow. And, um, Sarah Smith, thank you so much for your donation. Um, folks, we do have a donate button on these posts. So the donations like Sarah's allow us to continue these virtual programs and our lectures and um, all of this amazing programming we're bringing to you all. So thank you. Your donation is greatly appreciated. And also before uh, Brad wraps up, I would like to ask you all to join me in wishing Brad a very happy birthday. Thank you for spending your birthday with us, Brad. Um, and that's all I got, so continue thank, with thank, your spiel. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I won't tell you how old I am. Um, so yeah, so tomorrow we'll be doing Field Trip Fridays, and then next week we will continue with our, actually a semi-abridged version next week, because Monday we're, Moat Monday? Yeah. Okay, so Monday we're going to continue with, uh, with our moat presentations, and then Tuesday and Thursday we'll be back here in the museum with me exploring uh, different aspects of, of the many really cool exhibits that we have to offer. And then on Friday we will be back to, uh, for our field trip Friday. And then on Wednesday we have a webinar to, that, that you can sign up for. Uh, archaeologist Ryan Hark is going to talk about um, his findings at a Stock Island site. He is studying um, ancient, ancient Indian, um, prehistoric Indian, Indian sites. And uh, Stock Island is, is a really interesting site. And he's going to share some of his findings with us on Wednesday, which is going to be really cool. He always does a great job with those presentations. And I, for one, love all the Indian heritage we have here in the Florida Keys. So um, again, thanks for joining us. And Sarah, thank you very much for that donation. And Ellen Aish, thank you for your donation. And thank you to all the birthday wishes that are coming in for Brad Excellent. right now. He'll be able to see all of those uh, when he hops off the the live feed and gets back in front of his computer a little later. Or right. maybe not. Maybe you'll look at them tomorrow. No, I'll, I'll be, <laughs> it's a work day for me. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, you guys. Have a good day.